السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونسبحه ونقدسه على آلائه ونعمائه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إلها واحدا أحدا فردا صمدا حيا قيوما نؤمن له بالربوبية ونقر له بالعبودية من يهد الله فهو المهتدي ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ونشهد أن سيدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك وترحم على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت وسلمت وباركت وترحمت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد وصل اللهم وسلم على جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين والشهداء والصالحين وعترة نبيك الطاهرين عباد الله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل قال تعالى في كتابه الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن ينسسكم قرح فقد مس القوم قرح مثله وتلك الأيام نداولها بين الناس وليعلم الله الذين آمنوا ويتخذ منكم شهداء والله لا يحب الظالمين صدق الله العلي العظيم وصل على محمد وآل محمد It has been narrated that when the Prophet, peace be upon him, decided to depart Mecca, the city that he was born in, the city that he was familiar with, really the only city that he was familiar with up until that point, where he had many attachments. It is the city where he grew from adolescence into an adult, where his reputation was known as al-sadiq al-amin, the truthful, trustworthy one. And you can imagine the pain in the heart of the Prophet, peace be upon him, as he had to bid farewell. And the reports tell us that before he bade farewell, he looked to the city behind him. And he said, O oh Allah, by Allah, I am leaving you. And I know that you are the most beloved land of Allah to him and the most honored in his sight. And had your people not driven me out, I would not have left. In another report, he says, O oh Allah, you know that they have driven me out of the most beloved land to me. So settle me in the most beloved land to you. Up until this time, Mecca has been my preference. It's my beloved land. I grew up here. I love it. And now I have to part ways with the place that I love. So I'm asking you, O oh Allah, to settle me in a place that you love. It was my turn to love this. Now take me where you want me to go. And the Prophet had no guarantee that he was ever going to return to his home. No guarantee. It was not until the Prophet was on an expedition, uh, a missionary expedition, teaching some of the tribes of Islam and delivering the message. And we know the story of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed inside of the prayer, changed the qibla of the Muslims from Jerusalem to Mecca. And the Prophet turned, Jibra'il, the narration says Jibra'il allowed the Prophet to turn 180 degrees from the north to the south. And that was the sign that the conquest of Mecca was imminent. Because why would Allah turn him to a direction of a place that is going to remain on its idolatry, that is going to remain on its paganism? So that was the first sign that the Prophet, peace be upon him, would return. But again, there was no guarantee. The Prophet left with a heavy heart, with a broken heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran, in yamsaskum qarhum faqad massal qawma qarhum mithluh. That if you suffer a blow, remember that you are not the only one. You're not the only one who loses. Even your enemy who you fight against, they have their losses as well. The Prophet, peace be upon him, had no guarantee. However, his heart was full of hope. He knew 
that one day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would return him to this promised land. And truly he did when he first saw the dream. And then God says to him in Surah Al-Fatih, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina liyaghfira laka Allahu ma taqaddama min dhanbika wa ma ta'akhar. Truly we are granting you a manifest victory. Sometimes the manifest victory is there. It's dormant. The seeds are there. Yet it has not been fertilized. It has not have been given its time to emerge. So the Prophet left and that feeling of not knowing whether we would return and not just not knowing whether we would return to our homeland but this new land that we have come to, are we going to survive here? Because if you fast forward to the battle of Al-Ahzab mentioned in the Quran, the battle of the trench, Surah Al-Ahzab chapter 33, Allah tells the Muslims, إِذْ جَاءُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ وَإِذْ زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارُ وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجِرَ وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ That your enemy came to you from above. They shot arrows at you. They shot missiles at you from above. وَمِنْ أَسْفَلَ مِنْكُمْ They came up from the ground, meaning that you did not notice them. They, they surrounded you. All of a sudden, they decided to surround you. وَإِذْ زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارِ You know, your eyes went back into your head. وَبَلَغَتْ الْقُلُوبِ الْحَنَاجِرِ such, uh, such a wonderful expression that your hearts came to your throats. You know, sometimes you have that feeling. Sometimes your heart sinks into your stomach and sometimes it feels like you want to puke out your heart. You know, it comes up here. He says, your hearts were here, meaning that you were terrified. You were losing your life out of fear. You had not even gone out into the battlefield. وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبُ الْحَنَاجَرَةِ And the worst part, وَتَظُنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ الظُّنُونَ This is the most devastating part. That you began to assume things about God. You began to doubt the ability of God to protect you and give you victory. So what did the Muslims have to do in order to protect themselves? Well, they built a trench, as the name of the battle suggests. And I've mentioned this a few times, and you see the geography of the city of Medina is surrounded by volcanic rock, jagged volcanic rock. If you fly into Medina, you can actually see it. Next time if you fly in, you'll notice the surroundings. And this is the type of terrain that an army cannot pass through. They have to find an open pass. The only open pass was towards the north. And so they were vulnerable in that direction. So they built a trench. The Prophet, peace be upon him, he turned to his companions. He said, what do we do? If this coalition attacks us, all of them together, what do we do? So it was Salman al-Muhammadi who decided that we should dig a khandaq, a trench, to protect us from them. And so they did. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, was not standing there, you know, like, uh, like sometimes you see uh, Caltrans, you know, there's five guys outside and there's one guy in the hole doing all the work, you know. So it wasn't like that. The Prophet rolled up, no offense to anyone who works for Caltrans, by the way. But the Prophet rolled up his sleeves and he said, I will work. I will be the one to carry. And then all of a sudden, they come across a rock. You know, when you're digging, you come across different types of terrain. There's soil, there's rock, there's different things you can, they come across a rock that they could not strike. So they call the Prophet. And they call Salman, it's his idea, let him figure out the solution. So they call the Prophet, the Prophet goes down into the ditch. Remember, they are completely surrounded from every angle. And the Prophet takes the pickaxe from Salman. Every tool that they had used before that was breaking against this rock. The narration says that he took the pickaxe from Salman and said, Bismillah, in the name of Allah, and he struck it once. When he struck the rock, he broke a third of it. And a light emerged into the direction of Yemen, illuminating that space. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Allahu Akbar, I have been given the keys to Yemen. I can see the gates of Sana'a from my place here as if they were the teeth of dogs. This is an expression. You know, dogs don't show their teeth until you get very close. So he's saying, I can see the palaces of Sana'a as if I see the teeth of dogs. And then he struck a second time, he broke another third. Another flash appeared in the direction of Arum, the Byzantine Empire. 
illuminating the space. He said, Allahu Akbar, I have been given the keys to Syria by Allah. I can see its red palaces from my place here. And then he struck one more time and it went in the direction of Persia. And he said the same thing. He says, Jibreel has informed me that my nation will be victorious over them. So rejoice with the good news of victory. Remember, the Muslims are surrounded from every angle. So Abdullah ibn Ubay, the chief of the hypocrites, who's mentioned in the Quran, who tried to foil, uh, you know, who tried to uh, uh, attempt against the Prophet, peace be upon him, he turns to his companions, says, you hear what Muhammad is saying? He's stuck in a ditch down there. We're all stuck. We can't even go to the bathroom without looking over our shoulders, yet he's telling us that we're going to conquer this place and that place. But did that shake the conviction of Rasulullah in any way? Did he go hide and cower and say, I can't believe they're talking about me behind my back and forget this, I don't even want to be here in the first place. Most of us, we lose hope just over a few words. Have you seen sometimes when you've given up on something just because someone was mean to you? You know, someone hurt your feelings a little bit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I want people who are, who are strong, who are convicted. And if you're not up for the task, I will find people who will replace you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu, man yartadda minkum an deenihi, fasawfa yati allahu biqawmin yuhibbuhum wa yuhibbuna. O you who believe, if any of you go back on your faith, yartad, ridda, to go back on your faith, God will soon replace you with the people He loves and whom love Him. So if you don't love God and He doesn't love you, it's easy for God to simply replace. Is there something in all of us here sitting in this room? Is there something special about our shared that we have about our DNA that makes us the chosen people? Is anyone here chosen? Please let us know. I'm not chosen, I don't know if anyone else. But if someone's chosen, please let us know. We're not chosen genetically. We are chosen based on what? What is the thing that separates all of us? Allah says, I created you in nations and tribes. I purposefully made you different. I purposefully made it that one person on one side of the country has an accent and the other person has another accent and another cuisine. And we fight over these things. We fight, we make fun of this person's accent, we make fun of this person's cuisine, this person's from this part of the country. Why does Allah create us in this way? He says the most honored and the best of you are whom? Inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum. We all know this, ahsantu. Taqwa. And I was mentioning this yesterday when we spoke about how the Quran affirms the scriptures and the devotional practices of the people before, the Jews and the Christians, that they have the guidance in their Torah they have the guidance in their inji, And some of them take it seriously. Some of them take it more seriously than the Muslim who has received the revealed law from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the first Muslim scholars to leave the Middle East and travel to Europe, Jamaluddin al-Afghani. Do you know what he said when he came back? He was from Afghanistan. He came back, he said, I traveled to lands where I saw non-Muslims behaving as Muslims should. And here I live amongst Muslims who behave like kuffar. You see the irony in this? So Allah says, if you want to continue, I will replace you. It's not a big deal for, you, for me to replace you. There's nothing special about your flesh and your blood that I have given you that I have not given anyone else. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, he was firm in his resolve. He did not care about how their media portrayed him or any of his followers. He knew that he was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And God promises victory to those who remain loyal to him. One more example I'll give you. How the Prophet was not shaken. Was during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah or Hudaybiyah. Where the Muslims finally decided that we have, we've defended ourselves enough times. We are competent enough and we are strong enough that we can go back and claim what is ours. So they marched on Mecca and the Meccans met them halfway and they said, you will not proceed. You won't perform the pilgrimage. So they sat down and they wrote the Treaty of Hudaybiyah that the Muslims agreed not to come this year. And many Muslims were furious. 
Some of them, even in that instance, they wanted to rebel against the Prophet, peace be upon him. Some of them were looking for the slightest, ah, whatever it is, to rebel against the Prophet and say, see, he's a weak man, we can do better than him. So the Prophet had to deal with these things internally as well as he dealt with the non-Muslims. So Suhail ibn Amr sits down and the Prophet makes whom his scribe, who was his scribe in the Treaty of Hudaybiyah? Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. So Suhail is sitting there, the Prophet is sitting there, he's, uh, Ali is sitting there, he's waiting to write. And the Prophet begins to speak the words for him to write. He says, from Muhammad, the Messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The Messenger of God to Suhail ibn Amr, the chief of the Meccans. Suhail said, no. He said, what is this title, the Messenger of God? He said, do you think in our right mind we would continue to fight against you if we actually believe that you were the Messenger of God? Remove this line, the title, the Messenger of God. So the Prophet tells Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ali says, I, not me, Ya Rasulullah, I can't do this. He says, I'm telling you, Ya Ali, for their sake, for the sake of this peace. So there's a little bit of resistance, not resistance, but imagine Ali ibn Abi Talib, is, he, he doesn't want to, to, to demean anything, take anything away from the Prophet, especially because that guy is demanding it. So he says to him, Ya Ali, don't worry about it. And what will happen to me will happen to you one day as well. One day you will find yourself face to face against people, and they will do anything to remove this title of Amir al-Mu'mineen which I have bestowed upon you. But what they say and what they don't say does not matter. I know I am the Messenger of God. You know I am the Messenger of God. Everyone here knows I am the Messenger of God. Who cares what their media believes? You expect that we're not going to have resistance? You expect that we're not going to have enemies? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in yamsaskum, in, in yamsaskum if you have suffered a blow, they have suffered one like it. And he, Allah says that these days, we, we, we deal them out, there's, there's a rotation. Not every day you are going to be victorious. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, there's two, two types of days. يَوْمٌ لَكَ وَيَوْمٌ عَلَيْكَ one day is for you and one day is against you. Don't get too excited and overzealous when things are going for you and don't get too sad and depressed when things are not going for you. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, in his stoic nature, he did not care what they referred to him as and everything they put up, all of the resistance that they put up, whether it was the Meccans, whether it was the tribes of the people of the book in Medina, they could not go against the, the, the spirit of, of the Muslim community at that time, no matter how hard they try. But brothers and sisters, again, I remind you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to our aid and He gives us victory, not just because we say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. It's when we believe, when we remain steadfast on our belief, Allah says, I will support you. I will see you through this. And these are times where we are living very difficult times. We see our brothers and sisters are suffering every day over a year of course it's been more than 70 years but i'm talking about just recently over a year more than 40,000 people in gaza alone slaughtered mercilessly most of them women and children where are the combatants that you talk about where are the terrorists that you talk about where are they you have the most advanced nation of the, in in the world advanced army we just gave you billions of dollars but we can't give money to people in North Carolina and Florida. So we must remain steadfast on our belief. We must remain steadfast in our dua, brothers and sisters. It makes a difference. It does make a difference. Let us not lose hope. Even when we see the enemy has gathered around us, has surrounded us. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-Asri inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر وصلوا على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين 
نحمده ونسبحه ونقدسه على آلائه ونعمائه ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن سيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد وصل الله وسلم على أوسيائه وخلفائه علي أمير المؤمنين وقائد الغر المحجلين وعلى البضعة الطاهرة فاطمة الزهراء سيدة نساء العالمين وعلى سبط نبي الرحمة وسيد شباب أهل الجنة الحسن والحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الهادي المهدي عجل الله تعالى فرجه وسهل مخرجه وجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه عباد الله أوصيكم ونفسي بتقوى الله عز وجل Brothers and sisters you know, when we claim to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to love our families, to love our brothers and sisters who are thousands of miles away, to feel the pain that they feel. Love does not come without a cost. It doesn't come without a price. When you love something, when you love someone, everything is painful. It hurts. You can't love someone, marry them, and say, well, I'm going to smile with you and laugh in the good times, but if you're going through pain, I'm just going to go in the other room. It's painful. You have to take on that cost of, of pain. There's some sacrifice when you choose to love someone. You can also choose not to love and not to care. You'll find no pain in that regard. You might find other pain, the pain of isolation, the pain of loneliness. But to live in this dunya is to suffer. None of us claim that this dunya is the heaven and this is our final abode. We understand it. One day a man comes to Imam Ali salam and he proclaims his love for him. He proclaims his love for God. And the Imam responds to him in the following way. He says, In kunta tuhibb Allah, fasta'id li balaihi. If you claim to love God, then prepare yourself for his trials his trials not the trials that i think are going to benefit me libalaihi the type of trials that he chooses for you and it may be com diff completely different than what he's chosen for your brother and sister he says in kunta tuhibba muhammad sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad fasta'id lil faqr prepare yourself for poverty doesn't mean you'll be a poor man. You know, you'll lose all your money once you start loving the Prophet, peace be upon him. But we have examples of people who gave everything that they had because they loved the Prophet, peace be upon him, deeply. Chief amongst them. And the best example of this was whom? Khadija bin Khuwailid alayhi salam. One of the three wealthiest people in all of Mecca. Yet when she died, there was not enough to purchase a kafan for her, a shroud. And then he says, وَإِن كُنْتَ تُحِبُّنِي فَاسْتَعِدْ لِكَثْرَةِ الْأَعْدَاءِ And if you claim to love me, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, if you claim to love me, then prepare yourself for an abundance of enemies. You are automatically going to have a target on your back. You are automatically going to have crosshairs on your forehead. Because they know me and they know what I stand for. And they hate everything that I stand for. And if you stand with me, there is suffering. So you have to prepare yourself. So when we claim to love someone, if we claim to love our brothers thousands of miles away, do we expect that to do that without having any pain, without feeling any suffering? The Prophet, peace be upon him, God describes him that he felt the pain of those around him. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِّنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِدْتُمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ Rahim. He cares for you more than you care for yourself. He feels your pain sometimes more than you feel your own pain. This was the Prophet, peace be upon him. Brothers and sisters, we have to spiritually fortify ourselves. Every day, we are seeing trials and tribulations. And we're not untouchable. We think we're untouchable just because we have five lane highways and because there's safety. We're not untouchable. If we decide to disobey if we decide to go against the commands of God. Who says that we are going to enjoy the safety and security forever? 
Why cannot we imagine ourselves in the place of our brothers and sisters? Can you imagine your own children? Have you seen the images of what they do to children? It's intentional. I promise you it's intentional. Because they want to humiliate. They want to cause terror. They want to cause fear. They don't know that all of this fuels us. It gives us even more fuel in our fire. So brothers and sisters, let us learn to fortify and protect ourselves spiritually. There's so many things. Uh, giving sadaqah on a daily basis, reciting uh, ayatul kursi, and there are so many du'as that you can find in Mafatih al-Jinan and other books, such as the du'a that begins with Bismillah khayrul asma, Bismillah rabbul ardi was sama, Bismillah alladhi la yadurru ma'a ismihi sammun wa la da. Recite these du'as, memorize them. There's a du'a from Al-Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam. And this comes from Dua Abu Hamza Thumali. He says the following. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika. This is how we strengthen ourselves. We seek refuge in God. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-kasali, wal-fashali, wal-hammi, wal-jubni, wal-bukhli, wal-ghaflati, wal-qaswati, wal-maskanati, wal-faqri, wal-faqa. Oh Allah, I seek refuge in you. Number one, from kasal. Laziness. I seek refuge in you from lazy. And lazy is not just physical laziness, not going to work or choosing not to work. You know, you can be intellectually lazy sometimes when you make an assumption about someone without having found out the truth. This is intellectual laziness. From defeat, oh Allah, I seek refuge in you from the feeling of being defeated, not of losing. Every one of us is going to lose every once in a while. But from that humiliating feeling of defeat which debilitates me. I seek refuge in you from it. Walhammi wal jubni wal bukhl. From worry, from cowardice, from stinginess. Wal ghaflati wal qaswa. From negligence. Every day we are negligent. We are negligent of our souls. We are negligent of our bodies. We are negligent of Allah's rights upon us. Hard heartedness. Qaswa. Again, God tells the Prophet, peace be upon him. Walau kunta fadlan ghalid al qalbi. If you were stern and you were hard-hearted, then they would have left you. They would not have stayed with you. What is maskana? Maskana, no, it's not, it's not being naive. Maskana is being needy. When you're needy to someone or something. Unnecessary attachments. Wal-faqri, wal-faqri, wal-faqa. Faqr, of course, is poverty. Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nasu, antumul fuqara'u ilallah. There's one type of poverty that we cannot avoid. And that is, al-faqru lillah. Our poverty and our need to Him. Every other type of poverty you can alleviate. You're broke, go make some money. You'll alleviate that. But if you're broke with God, what and who will alleviate it? Nothing. So, wal-faqri, wal-faqa, and deprivation. Oh Allah, give me enough in my life that I can actually worry about the things that I need to worry about, not the things that I do not want to worry about. Oh Allah, do not make this dunya the center of my thoughts and my concerns. This is a dua of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Sometimes we get so caught up with this dunya and the shaitan wants to make it the center of our mind. He wants to, he wants to put it right there. Yet we have to resist. Because as I mentioned, brothers and sisters, what we are going through is, is difficult. And if, if what you see, these images, are anxiety-inducing, are sadness-inducing, remember the dua. As soon as you start to recite dua in the Qur'an, these bring a healing to the soul. Let us become closer to Allah. Let us become closer to the words of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam. Brothers and sisters, today is the day of Friday. Let us raise our hands and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this blessed day to relieve all of those who are oppressed, our brothers and sisters in Gaza, in Palestine, in Lebanon, in Iran, in Iraq, in Syria, everywhere in the world, here on the other side of the country. Oh Allah, we ask you to send upon them your relief. We ask you, oh Allah, to allow us to come to the aid of those who are oppressed. We ask you, oh Allah, to forgive our sins on this day and to make us uh, your citizens and your soldiers on the right path. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim.
اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك قاضي الحاجات إنك على كل شيء قدير برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين